Hello, it's uh, Azir Factual here from SuccessfulPropertyInvestmentSecrets.com where investors confess their best kept secret tips, systems, resources that enable anyone to quickly build an income stream from property. And now today I have the lovely pleasure of uh, speaking with Mark Ianson who is an expert in finding motivated sellers and negotiating great property deals. He's also a professional property trainer and coach. So welcome to the call, Mark. Hi, Azu, and hi everyone on the on the that's listening. Um, it's good to speak to you today. Yeah, yeah, let's get started. Right, let's jump into it. So, first question, Mark, is if um, someone was interested in building an income stream from property that would allow them to leave their job in the next twelve months. Uh, and wanted to know what they should uh, listen, why they should listen to you. Uh, what would you tell them? Wow, that's a that's a good first question. <laughs> the, I, I've been in property since 1994, and I've made tons of mistakes. The first one I bought was a uh, it was a, it was a dump. If I'm honest, it was a four bed detached dump that I thought I'd make a fortune on, doing it up and then selling it a massive profit. So I did that. It took me about 12 weeks to do this house up, and I lived in it as I did it, which was my first mistake. I don't know if everyone, ever, anyone's ever done that, but it's the dirtiest thing you can probably ever do. Um, I couldn't keep clean. I, there was dust everywhere all over the house, and it took me ages. But <clears throat> I, uh, I managed to finish it, and when I finished it, I, I couldn't sell the thing because I was the guy that would drive to Wix or B&Q every day to buy one screw or one screwdriver or one bolt or one bag of cement or whatever I was doing at the time. And it, 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 I, I just had so much in the deal that I couldn't reduce the price enough to get rid of it. So I had to sell it for top whack, and it was a slow market at the time in '94, and I, I just couldn't get rid of it. So I, I, I must admit that all the cogs, I wasn't an experienced investor at the time, and all the cogs were in place. But what I did do is I managed to swap it for two houses uh, from a developer in the northeast, and that was uh, a two bed. Oh, I'll just knock that phone off. <laughs> These, uh, I swapped it for two houses, a two-bed terrace and a three-bed detached. And I lived in the, the uh, three-bed detached and then rented out the two-bed terrace. And that was that was my first kind of cog dropping into place because this one cash flowed uh, quite well. It was a couple of hundred pounds a month. And I thought, wow, if I could get some more of these, um, that, that would be on the way. So the next thing that happened was uh, my buddy who lived about three streets away he got into financial trouble and he and he he got made redundant from the post office and he he was he started to flap a bit because he was running out of money and the bank were chasing him and the credit card companies were chasing him and stuff for you know paying back the loans and we we sat at his kitchen table and with a box of tissues got everything out all the credit card companies all the loans every all, all the financial woes that he'd been going through um, I sorted them out for him, and I ended up buying his house, and then I uh, had him as a tenant for about six years, well, just over six years, and he's, he's still a friend today. And that was my next cog, because that was showing me how to negotiate with lenders and loan companies and credit cards and you know people that get themselves into a sticky situation. So that was my next cog. And and now I, I thought it was really reasonably successful, so I, I bought my uh, f first HMO. It wasn't called a HMO back in 90... This was 95... It wasn't actually called that. We, was, we just called it a big house with rooms, and we kind of rented it out, put as many tenants in as we possibly could, uh, and rented it out, um, you know, as, as as quick as we could. And it, the tenants in those types of properties are quite transient. So every time I lost a tenant, I would move into the room and then do the room up. Um, and I went around the whole house doing that. It took me around 18 months to do the whole house, um, but that one cash flowed by uh, over 750 a month, uh, and that was back in 1995. So. Yeah. So that's when I started, and and since then, the, the thing is, on on a when you're operating a patch or an area, uh, looking for deals and or looking for leads and deals, you you you, don't, you can't buy them all. You, you don't want every deal because um, some of them don't suit. For instance, I don't buy flats um, at all. So if I come across a flat that's a deal, but it isn't a deal that I want, then I just trade it on and make some money. So that's what I do. Fantastic stuff. Okay. Well. Um... Moving on to the next question, um, what would you say, what's one thing that perhaps even your most avid follower probably doesn't know about you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, good one. Um, well, 
pro people probably don't know about me is that um, I spent 12 years in the British Army and um, I saw some action, got decorated, and I uh, had a parachute accident in uh, my 11th year and the parachute didn't open properly and I busted up all my legs and, and spent the next uh, kind of nearly 12 years being that guy that would uh, get a cab to the pub. I mean, I wouldn't walk anywhere. Um, I didn't do any exercise particularly and it took me a while to, uh, and a few operations to get to get my legs right and stuff. And, wow. and then I, um, in 2010, finally, well, it was actually 2008, I, finally I was out of pain after an operation and I went on to l run the London Marathon in 2010. Oh, fantastic. Um, out of interest, what times you get? I'm not telling you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you completed it then, right? <laughs> yeah, I've got a completers medal, but um, right. <laughs> or a finishers medal they call it. But yeah, it was it wasn't pretty and it wasn't fast. <laughs> well, no, it says, it says something for achieving your goals and sticking sticking with it because that's not easy at all. Well, congratulations on that. Okay. No, um, right. So uh, the next thing I wanted to ask was uh, if someone was starting to do property sourcing, which is what you touched on, uh, with regards to if you had the number of deals that um, you had that you didn't want to buy or you couldn't buy. So if someone was uh, walking down that path and they, they found these properties that they couldn't buy themselves or didn't want themselves, what uh, would you say is the sort of first steps that you would uh, advise them to take? Ah, first steps. It's, this is quite a good question because the, the, um, if, I, if I'm talking to someone now, I mean, I did loads wrong. I, I ran a patch in the northeast and did it all wrong. I still got deals, but I just did it totally wrong. And then I moved down to the Midlands and, and ran a patch in the Midlands. Um, we did that kind of right, and, and and now I kind of pounce on people's areas and help people do this stuff because the the first step to take is doing the research on the area. And it's there's some companies out there I know will will advise that if you're in London, it's too expensive. Go and invest in Hull, um, or go and invest in the North because it's the properties are cheaper. And this uh, property sourcing isn't about the property. Actually, the properties are largely irrelevant at this point. The, the whole deal is, uh, and the trick is, uh, not the trick, the skill is spotting where the money is in the deal and then pulling it out to pay yourself. So there's tons of different scenarios. We might, we might touch on later, but there's loads of different scenarios where there's money in a deal. It's just spotting that money and pulling it out. If you know your area, uh, and I'm quite vocal about local, so... Uh, the, the area you should run is no more than 30 minutes from where you spend most of your time, and that's either your, uh, where you live, or where you work, or you know, if you, you know, where, wherever you, your your kind of local area is. That's where you should be doing deals. Um, and the reason is because you've already done some of the work because you know the routes to the pub, you know where Granny's is, you know the, um, you know the, where the shops are, you know where the industrial estates are, you know where all the, um, if you, if you're going for BMV deals, you know where all the smaller houses are, you know where the the working class areas are, you know where the the, the middle class areas are, so you, you kind of know some of this stuff already, so you've already done part of the work. So it's pointless going four hours up north to do a property deal when you can do it in your own backyard. So that's mm -hmm. kind of the first advice I'd give is know, know your ground, know your patch, and um, do the research properly. Right. And you mentioned uh, BMV, so just in case anyone didn't know what that was, what do you, what do you class as a BMV? Uh, ah, right, so yeah, yeah, good point. Uh, technical terms, uh, below market value is... is Anything that's uh, that the vendor will agree to sell below the actual market value, hand on heart valuation. We're not we're not surveyors, obviously, but um, if you've done your research properly and you know your numbers and you know your prices and values in the area, then it's a discount off that um, off that known value or, or best guesses. Let's call it a best guess valuation. Okay, right. Well, um, moving on because uh, I do want to. Uh, there's there's some really great questions I've got coming up for you that I think will help people a lot. Um, one of them actually is, uh, what's some of the biggest mistakes that you see people making in relation to property investing in general or property sourcing? Uh, <clears throat> biggest mistake? Uh, well, there's, pr there's probably a couple. The, the, for, let's deal with the first. The first one is get rich quick. Mm. This is certainly not get rich quick. It's it's planning, putting systems in place, putting putting all your all your stuff uh, to run your property business in place. It's not um, jumping on the next on the next big thing. It's not jumping on anything trendy. What what I do is actually fairly standard. It's been done like this for tons of years. Well, since the 90s, um, by me and other people. It's not it's not there's nothing new in it. It's just being methodical and having the right systems in place and not trying to 
uh, drive a Ferrari on your first deal because it's just not going to happen and you'll fall over. Just it's a it's a gentle plod uh, to richness. Uh, so a slow plod rather than a get rich quick. I mean you will get rich uh, when you do it, but it's a it's a get rich slow, not a get rich quick. Okay. That's the the first one. The second one is 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 going after the the, the the massive deals, the big numbers. I met loads of people that talk to me about two and a half million pound deals, and um, can you sell me this property? It's two and a half million, or three million, or or even more. And I said, look, these these things are quite hard to sell, and and I've sold a lot of property, and if I think they're hard to sell, then go for the little stuff. Go for the three hundred thousand. Go for the four hundred thousand properties. Go for the the, the hundred gram properties or or flats. Go for the Go for the small stuff that's easy to sell. And mm. back in the '90s, when uh, Robert Kiyosaki released Rich Dad Poor Dad, which which most most property investors that's kind of the birth of kind of buy to let property investing in this country, is it, he was he was buying uh, small apartment or you know apartments in Hawaii, and it's it's cheap stuff, and that's what we should go for. It's the cheaper stuff. It doesn't matter what, comparatively in the north, it might be two bed house in inside the M25 or in London, it might be a one bed flat or you know, somewhere cheaper, but uh, comparatively, it's the cheapest in the area, not the not the, not the big chunky stuff. Leave the big chunky stuff for the posh estate agents. That's what they're there for. <laughs> so uh, basically, don't think that you're going to get rich overnight. It's not something that uh, uh, is, is realistic. Really, it's something that you takes time, build your processes in place, and along the way, really should be going after the more smaller deals of. Of maybe sub three hundred thousand, as opposed to these half million, one million pound plus bigger deals. Yeah, uh, that's what I'd say, definitely. Brilliant, great bit of advice, I think. Great. Okay, so um, imagine we gave you a DeLorean, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you could jump back in time. So you're starting all over again with uh, no money to invest at all. Uh, what would you do differently or the same with with your knowledge that you've got now? Ah, good question. Back to um, oh, okay. I'd, <laughs> um, uh, first of all, I wouldn't be a developer. I, it's, it's, I'll leave that to the developers and the and the guys with those skills. And uh, I concentrate on recognizing. I, I, I'm a trader. I, I know the numbers. So if there's, let's say there's, uh, I don't know, a freeze of no, working out for the for the viewers on today. But 100 grand property. If I can secure that for 70 to 75 grand. If I don't want to keep it, I can trade it on and put a little bit on there for myself. If I want to keep it, then I've got the chunk of equity that uh, you know that I've, I've negotiated on the discount. That's doing the numbers. I don't I don't carry bricks or tiles anymore. Um, I certainly don't uh, carry bags of cement because they're really heavy. So I don't do anything like that anymore. <laughs> and I wouldn't do that again. I'm afraid it's my, my skill is on the numbers, and I'll leave the the trades guys with their skills because they they know what they're doing and they're good at it. So. Fantastic. So, I mean, even on that example which you've you've mentioned there, and you did allude to property sourcing and not getting uh, rich quick. Still, if you found if you negotiated a deal at a uh, hundred thousand pound house down to seventy five, and you sold that on to someone else at eighty or whatever, um, that's still uh, a five thousand pound profit in your pocket. Is it? Is it not? Or yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. Mm. A, the thing is. Um, you're absolutely right. This is this is kind of my um, my business model is that there's money in the deal if it's negotiated properly. So it's negotiated down. You don't need this. Uh, there's an old-fashioned term, 25% BMV, which people quite often use on forums and stuff. And it's not really about that. If if, if I can negotiate a discount down, I can either secure the deal and pay the mortgage to sell the property if I, if I can force a bit of value by improving it or make it more attractive for sale so I can sell it quicker. Or I know the agents in the area so I can put it with a different one. And I can sell it back on the retail market and make all that profit. So if I secure something at 70, mm -hmm. I can resell it at 90 on the open market. It's got a discount of 10 because it was worth 100. And the difference between the um, the 90 and the 75 that I've secured it at is my profit. And that's that's my money. Wow. I, I know a number <laughs> of people that would say that's, that's rich pretty quick. But that's, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. That it's really a good income, but... Financially independent will take you a few deals to do. So, yeah. my basic my basic rule for for beginners, and you can get more complicated than this, but uh, my basic rule for beginners is think of what you're earning per month now, and I mean putting in the bank, not gross. What do you put in the bank right now? And, and most people say to me between three and five thousand pounds. So, whatever you're putting in the bank right now is your net figure to spend. 
that's the profit on each deal that you've got to make and do one deal a month that keeps you out of work now I promise you one deal a month won't take you 40 hours a week promise <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. I mean, uh, you mentioned the Rich Dad Poor Dad books, and I, I think I've read nearly all of them, to be fair. And uh, one of the things that he he mentions in his earlier books is that you need to be looking at around about a hundred properties, uh, really, to to essentially secure one. So if you're uh, and looking means you know looking maybe a right move, looking with your estate agents, and if you're if we take on what you've said. To the answer to the previous question of knowing your local area, that's going to make it all the more easier to, to meet your uh, estate agents and letting agents and really build a relationship with them and then they can also assist you in the, the looking at houses and, and bringing you stuff that they think would work or fit your plan. Absolutely right, I can't, I can't, I can't fault that or criticise that, yeah, absolutely right. Fantastic, okay, so moving on to the next question. Uh, what's one of the popular pieces of advice related to um, either property sourcing or it, property investing in general uh, that's completely wrong? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> right, there's there's one thing that I hear quite a lot, and I'm hearing it quite a lot at the moment. Is it's difficult to find deals in a rising market, which which presumably most would agree we're in at the moment, and uh, leads are thin on the ground. Now. Back in um, let's say 2009, uh, when the uh, you know just after the crash happened, and all the the, the property values kind of dumped, and that's when the, we should have been buying property, and we were buying property, and everybody should have been buying at the time because the prices were at the lowest, and that's um, uh, uh, the time to buy. Now we're in a rising market. People are saying that the leads are thin on the ground, and the the uh, you know the, the the deals aren't there anymore. The BMV deals aren't there anymore. Well, that is completely and utterly wrong. Yeah. It's just, uh, it is a myth. And the reason is, uh, during 2009 and 2010, when the, when the prices were, in fact, all the way to about 13, when the prices were on the, uh, on the floor, it was easy to get a deal because all you had to do was uh, ring up a lead, offer them a daft price, and some would accept, some wouldn't. And it was a numbers game in your marketing. Mm. And, and all the, uh, there's loads of amateurs got in the market because they could run a boiler room sales team just offering deals uh, you know, just offering numbers out to people that were motivated to sell. Whereas in a rising market, the amateurs kind of get out of the market and the professionals get in. Uh, well, they've always been there, but, you know, the professionals carry on. They're the ones that are negotiating uh, deals with uh, sellers, you know, in a real professional manner that they've always been doing, mm. but there's less competition. So the, the, the deals are there. The amateurs have just left the, left the building. So there, there are deals in a mar rising market, and I, and I use this particular model, which I call pre-made, and mm. pre-made's got two R's. Uh, so the, it's, it's actually a mnemonic for, for kind of remembering or learning the situations that someone would want to get out of a property, and they are uh, probate, repo, refurb, equity or lack of, migration, arrears, downsizing, and estrangement, which is just divorce. So if you remember the eight scenarios that you might find yourself in or a seller might find themselves in, uh, as a reason they want, might want to get out of a property quickly, that creates a deal. So a pre-made scenario creates a ready-made deal, and that's the way to remember it. Well, that's, again, uh, highlighting the fact that clearly you know exactly what you're talking about, and you obviously <clears throat> coach people because that kind of... Uh, a kind of uh, statement there is really easy to remember, and you, it means if you're going in to um, speak with vendors or whatever, you just have to remember in the head uh, which of these pre-made uh, situations do they fit into, and now I know I've got a deal, otherwise it's someone that I'll just follow up with later on and not waste my time going through all the conversations that that you do sometimes with yeah. uh, with vendors that are not willing to sell. Yeah. All right. Fantastic, brilliant. Okay, so the next question I have for you is, uh, where do you see property investing headed in the next six to twelve months, and what can we do to best prepare for it? In your opinion, obviously. Uh, <laughs> predictions, oh my word! <laughs> uh, I remember no one predicted the crash. <laughs> 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 so if you um, see another one of those, please let us know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that, that now we're in the rising market, the pros. As I said just earlier, that the, the pros will stay in the market as they've always been in, and there's quite a few people around there that do what I do. Sometimes when you're out on patch and you're and you're doing the marketing, and you're trying to get leads. 
you're, you're a one man band, so you feel kind of lonely out there. Mm. And but I promise you, there's tons of us out there. There's a couple of hundred of us on the ground now, putting boards out or leafleting or postcarding, whatever they're doing. But they are out there doing it, um, getting leads and and doing deals. And those guys will stay in the business. They'll they'll, they'll be there and they'll be trading deals for many years to come because it's it's although I say it's not get rich quick it does make you a, a nice little income for a, a lot less than 40 hours a week which most people work if they've got a full time job mm. so <clears throat> I th I think we've got good times ahead we've got a few years of, of capital growth especially in the south where flips are the kind of uh, the, the, the thing that, that, that are making decent money because at the moment because Lon the London market's kind of taken off and it's it's got the first you know the first umph of a, a rising market flips are a, a decent strategy to use to do there. But plus on on our workshops we kind of oh I kind of teach how to do flips without actually spending any money on them and stuff. So there's there's lots of little tricks and I, what I'd say to someone is it, it, we've got now and let's say three years. I mean it's it's best guess but let's say three years. We've got three years to make a shed load of money um, on trading deals doing flips um, and helping people out of sticky situations and that's a that's a fantastic time to be in the market. Brilliant. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, so uh, moving on to the next one. The next question is, what's one of the least known ways to achieve sort of like a passive income, and I use that word uh, carefully, yeah. from property that people often overlook or don't really know about? Oh, I don't really know. Um, well, there's one that I am. Um, it's not really passive. It's not really passive. I'll, I'll say it's a, more of an active um, uh, strategy. But there's lots of people that downsize, and I've got a, a chap that does this in in Liverpool, and I've got uh, a lady that does this uh, down on the south coast. And what they do is, it's a little known strategy because lots of people will pay you. Uh, this is vendors will pay you for helping them out, mm. especially the downsizing. And, and when I when I say downsize, I'm talking people in the mid 50s to 60s. And the, the kids have flown the nest. The house is too big. It's uh, it's maybe got stairs. The health's not too, not that great. They will pay you to help them move house. I uh, find a couple of properties, or you know, three properties to choose from, but eventually choose one that suits them in the area that they want to live in, and help sell their house as well. And they'll pay you to do that. And it's called being a buyer's agent. And as I said, I've got a couple of guys that do it, and. Everybody loves them when they do it because they're dealing with the estate agents that aren't particularly well liked by the by the public, um, especially the oldies as well. Mm. You help them deal with the lawyers because they, ha they maybe haven't sold a house for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. There's uh, good equity in the property normally in, with the oldies because they've, they've spent years paying the mortgage off, so you can you don't need a massive discount on the on the on the property. You just need it enough to pay yourself for doing the work, and it's a fairly simple, straightforward. Um, tasks to do. It's just mm. using contacts you've maybe already got on the ground anyway, but they'll pay you quite handsomely for it. I mean, you'll you'll make more on a deal than an estate agent would for doing an awful lot less work and, and no outlay to you. It's a it's a lovely way to make a living, and and we've done a few of them. And I've, as I say, I've got a couple of guys that just specialise in this stuff. It's a it's a great strategy. Mm, great. Okay. Brilliant. Um, so. Uh, the next question is, if the listeners can do <clears throat> only one thing based on what we talked about today, what would that be? One, uh, one thing, uh, that would be, I'd have to say go out and do the research on your patch. Do, I mean, I, and when I, I, I use this um, uh, a grid, uh, let's say I'm looking at BMV property and I'm looking at a Midlands-based town, for example, uh, working class, blue-collar type town, and... I use this nine box grid, like a, a tic-tac-toe, you know, noughts and crosses type uh, uh, grid. Across the top is the types of property I'm going to buy in the area. So a two bed terrace, a three bed terrace, and a three bed semi, because they're the ones that sell well or rent well to families. And then down the side of the grid, I'll put the three words, grot box, renter, palace. <laughs> I'll, explain, I'll explain what they are. <laughs> but you see where I'm going with this. Um, so on the area, on the on the ground that I'm looking to, to trade in, I've got to fill in my nine box grid. And the first property, a two bed terrace, or the first square, sorry, a two bed terrace is a grot box. That's one that needs uh, a total refurb. We don't do anything structural, but a total refurb, um, a new bathroom, new kitchen, new deck, or the whole lot. It's a bit of a dump, hence the word grot box. And then if I've got a price of that property on the area, a ball, it's not it's not exact, it's a ballpark, 
and then I fill in the next square, which is a renter, which is it's okay, it's a little bit dated, but it's you know, it's, it's serviceable for rent for tenants. That price can go in there, and then in the palace, that's a, a property uh, again as a two bed terrace, which is. Um, it, I mean, it's, it, it's gorgeously done out. It's got 100 watt light bulbs in it. The heating's on at 24 degrees C. It's got magnolia everywhere, gorgeous plush carpets, and there's a bread maker making bread in the kitchen. <laughs> Lovely property. So if I filled in my nine bot square with as close to hand on heart values as I possibly can for three grades of property and the three types of property that I buy in the area, I'm going pretty close to starting to know my patch, starting to know the numbers on my area, and starting, you know, to be able to recognise where a deal is. So then, if I see a property on right move in a couple of months' time, it happens to be cheaper, um, and I know what standard the property is. I can pounce on it, um, you know. I can pounce on it and get it, or you know, you know, bag a deal out of it. So, so l learn the, learn the patch, learn the nine. I, I'll think of a fancy title for this nine box grid <laughs> system. I haven't got one yet. I'll, I'll think of one and I'll publicise it somewhere. So, yeah, learn the nine box grid. If anyone. Uh actually has suggestions please leave some comments below this video it'll be interested to see what people think yeah brilliant <laughs> what, can the, what can it be named <laughs> that'd be brilliant so I'll happily get JV on that one <laughs> right so uh, the next question I have for you is uh, what was your biggest breakthrough in uh, property uh, sourcing or property investing in general and how did you discover it ah uh, uh, okay yeah biggest breakthrough was uh, there's actually there's actually two light bulb moments that happened during. Uh, I mean, I had little cogs go go on at the time, you know, drop into place along the journey, and, and we all do. And I mean, I still get little cogs dropping into place now, and because I don't know everything. Um, there's the first one was the HMO, which I realised that the cash flow on a HMO was was a lot more than a single. I, I must admit, I don't do HMOs anymore. But the the time when I needed the cash, uh, or I needed cash flow uh, quite substantially, the HMO has brought in the cash flow. Mm. That was the first one. The, the the second kind of breakthrough was that I, I didn't. I had. Uh, I think I had two properties at the time. And that was in my first two, and I met a lady, and she was doing a. Uh, a she was building her own house, and uh, with her husband, and she'd built this. She'd finished this house, and the idea was to sell it for profit. And it was a huge house. It was a, a kind of an L-shaped thing in a, in a country village up in up in Durham in the northeast, and it was five bedrooms. I mean, the kitchen was huge. It had 24 spotlights all around the place. This was in 94, 95, when spotlights <laughs> weren't really in kitchens. We still had strip lights in 94. Mm. So it had these massive, you know, these great number of spotlights around the kitchen. It looked really, really nice property. And I went to see the property because she couldn't sell it. And as soon as I saw the property, I thought, I know why you're not selling it. It's because it's too nice for the village. <laughs> um, because it was, it's a kind of pit mine, you know, a pit village. Um, the, the old mining villages, the, the mines would build little villages for the coal miners to work in, and there'd be kind of, you know, blue collar type stuff or working class type villages. So, and she'd built this massive house in this this um, big, uh, you know, pit village. Mm. And so it's too good for the people that live there, or too <laughs> expensive for the people that live there. And yeah. the people that want, could afford it wouldn't didn't want to live in the village, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, and over a glass of wine, I said, um, what you could do. Is you could knock a bit of it down and build a bungalow, and then you've got two houses to sell. I mean, they're both smaller, but you've got two houses to sell. And I'm not. This is. I mean, I've got pictures on my iPhone. There's, there's no word of a like gospel truth. Is that 12 weeks later she'd knocked half the house down and she had built a bungalow on this on in the grounds. Oh wow! And when I went to see it, I thought, this is this is. If she can do this. She wasn't a house builder. She was uh, she was a property person, but not a house builder. She wasn't a developer, but she'd knocked half of this house down. And built a bungalow out of the same bricks. Wow! I, I was just, I, 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 it was just a pivotal moment. I thought, Cracky can do anything uh, with property. It's, it, it's, it's just fantastic. And that was, that was, you know, that was my, uh, that, that was my thing. Moment. Yeah, that was my my breakthrough moment. That was my light bulb moment. I, I, I was then a property person full time. I, I was there. Hmm. Great. Okay. All right. So. Uh, that kind of leads on to the next question, really, which was, uh, what are some of the hardest lessons that you learned with regards to negotiating uh, deals with uh, vendors or investors? Uh, that's um, I, I, I've been stung a couple of times. I, I like to work with who I trust and who I know. And um, the thing is, nowadays I do small deals with someone when I first meet them, hmm. and uh, if the small deal is a few hundred pounds and I get ripped off, then 
I get ripped off for a few hundred pounds, it's actually no sweat from me really. But that means the other person won't work with me again uh, because I won't let them. So <clears throat> I, when when you uh, try and develop a power team, and a power team is a, a kind of, it's, it's an odd phrase, but a power team is the people that are around you making money together with you um, but maybe not being paid by you. So they're independent, but they're all part of your, uh, yeah, I suppose you could call it a thinking squad. Yeah. Your thinking squad have got to be people that are close that you can trust and 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 work with. And, and, and they develop over time, and you do slightly smaller deals, and then you do a little bit of a bigger deal. Yeah. And the thing is, everyone's a nice person when the champagne's flowing. <laughs> but you found out what they're like when it, the deal's gone wrong and it's not quite there or it's a bit stressy. Yeah. That's when you find out what they're really like. So... That's why we do little deals first, just to manage the uh, the relationship on, and, and and then you can start doing chunky deals. And so, uh, the, what the, the actual question is, what would I never do again? Is jump into a big deal with someone having first met them? Please, just please don't. So it goes <laughs> wrong. It's very painful, and mm. yeah, and you'll regret it. So. All right. Okay. And um, th if I could uh, just ask a sort of similar question but for vendors because you said when you first sat down with uh, was it your mate um, yeah and you sat down you went through his bills and things like that and you uh, and you obviously negotiated with his um, creditors and, and whatnot and in a, to be able to work out a good deal for him and yourself in looking at in terms of dealing with a vendor in that kind of situation are there any kind of uh, things that you might say uh, that you'd do again, you wouldn't do again there? Yeah, that's a good one. First of all, if you're out to help people and, and you like helping people, this is quite a good way of making a living because uh, you can you can build a portfolio yourself because you can keep whatever deals you want and you can trade the ones you don't want. So there's there's monetizing, you can monetize virtually every deal or every, every lead that you convert. The thing is that <clears throat> I would, <clears throat> because you're helping people, you'd have to have a hard heart not to feel a little bit for them when you're doing this. So yeah. it, it, it's quite easy to drop into an emotional state rather than a business state. And, and I'll give an example that the uh, divorce cases are quite emotional cases. And you, you, you have got to stay one step removed because this is about, uh, although it's a, a tragedy to, to go through, it's about business, it's about the numbers, it's about profit. And although you're not going to cause any more harm, because that's kind of one of the golden rules, is that you have to think about the numbers. We're not there to, um, to uh, as a shoulder to cry on. And I've done this a few times where um, I've been a shoulder to cry on in, in these sorts of cases because, I mean, I'm a bit of a softy, um, so I get involved too emotionally. And that's, that's one thing to just remember to take a step backwards. It's about the numbers, about business, it's about profit. So um, we do this for money, not for not for love, as it were. But, um, yeah, that's a... I, 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 st I must admit, I still struggle with it. I still, mm. um, yeah, I still get emotionally involved with people that are going through... <clears throat> going through bad times, you know, and it's um, it's tough. It's hard not yeah. to, really. I, I think yeah. you know we're all human beings at the end of the day, and we all feel uh, affinity for one another. So yeah, it's it's it is good to to bear that in mind that it's really it's a business deal. As much as you you try and help as much as you can, but if the numbers don't work, then you shouldn't be bending over backwards to make someone else's uh, problems your headache. I think. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay, it, uh, which kind of actually leads me on to the, the, this question, which you've, you've answered in somewhat, which was uh, for someone starting out in property and in investing, what would be your best tips with regards to actually finding property deals, negotiating with vendors, and, and maybe if this was regards to sourcing, uh, dealing with investors? Because I know you have a sandwich. They call you Sandwich Man, isn't that your nickname? As well? <laughs> they call me Sandwich Man, yeah. <laughs> I, I sit in the middle of two pieces of bread. <laughs> it, it's, it's funny because I... Um, uh, uh, those three titles, uh, sourcing property deals, I, I'd call that title leads. Negotiating with vendors is deals. And then dealing with investors is trades. So leads, deals, and trades. Mm. And, I, and I wrote a book about it uh, last year, last summer, uh, called Dominate Your Ground, and, and the Dominate Your Ground goes through. Um, it's not a storybook. It's uh, it's just what I do on the ground and how I do it. And there's around 12 different methods, from free to expensive, of sourcing uh, property leads and 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 you know marketing on the area once you know it. And then there's a whole chapter, a whole section on, um, or about a third of the book on negotiating with vendors, how to how to prepare, how to you do the curbside drills before you go in, how to do the call, what to do after the call, and how to follow up and stuff, um, and how to secure the deal. 
and then there's another third on dealing with investors and, and trading out the deal so you can put I'm from Yorkshire originally so um, it's about cashing till so it's about putting <laughs> cash in till the last third of the book and that's what we're all here for obviously so um, if yeah. I could if I could leverage your arm twist your arm for just one say one tip for for each one of those, so your your best tip for or, or a good tip for sourcing a deal would be yeah sourcing a deal would be or, or getting leads to start with would be uh, start small start in a smaller area and smaller area than half that mm -hmm. so it's a really really small area and when you're marketing out there is start stuff that doesn't cost a lot first because what's going to happen is uh, if if you run out of money before you get to a deal. It's starting to get. It'll start to get painful financially. So, what yeah. we do is we start as small as we can, test everything that we're doing, and then get bigger as we get deals in. So, the idea is that if you can get to a deal within 28 days, I've got a kind of four-week plan that I use for for students. So, a four-week plan: get to a deal, get some cash on the table, or, or or get the deal on the table ready and close ready to put cash on the table. It becomes less financially painful, yeah. and your business is therefore. Uh, if you've got the deal in the bank, the business is therefore paying for the past marketing and the future marketing, um, you know, so you can go faster later on. So that's about that's a, a great, I think, a great tip for sourcing leads. No, that is good. Yeah. Um, negotiating with vendors, I stick with a, a a model that I use, which is called Maps, and the, this is the format of the meeting. So Maps stands for meet and greet, which most people can do. Hi, my name is Mark from ABC Property. Then A stands for answers, which means you've got to ask loads of questions. Mm -hmm. B stands for presentation, which is presenting the deal that you're going to uh, eventually close on. And then S stands for signature. So as long as the deal is done in that order, so meet and greet, answers, presentation, signature, that's the format. We can get more complicated than that later on and you know practice stuff. And but that's it. That just follow the format. If you get to A, so meet and greet and ask a load of questions to get answers. And then get stuck. By all means, if you're in the middle of a deal, just give me a call, and I'll try and get you. I'll try and get you a deal. Uh, that seems fair enough. Yeah, brilliant. Um, and then dealing with investors, a good tip is to take a little bit of pain money from them when you're selling the deal, because if you if you don't take any pain money, there will um, not, not everyone, but the one you don't take some pain money from, are your reservation fee or some form of deposit, uh, they will mess you about from the start of the deal to the completion and then try and haggle with you afterwards as well so always take some pain money that's a great great tip uh, in fact all three of those were great great tips and um, thank you very much for, for your generosity in that that's, that's really good um, what's your biggest challenge related to starting out as a property sourcing business and uh, what's the solution for it so someone who's thinking right I've, I've heard this uh, this stuff. I've been on the fence for a while. Maybe I've done a couple of courses. I'm interested in starting my sourcing business. Uh, so, what what challenges might they? What early challenges might they face, and how? What would you advise them to to solve that? Uh, they <clears throat> they could try and start doing things too fast and too big, and then wonder wonder why it doesn't work. Yeah. So I'll give an example of that. We, we I was doing some uh, a coaching day down in Bournemouth, and we were uh, and I was uh, we had all the local newspapers in, in a, you know around the floor of this hotel room that we were kind of doing we we're doing the research at the time, and we called the newspapers and, and the the average price for a what they call a big stamp. I, um, I'll describe that. So a one by five, it's about um, well big first class large stamp size. That's an advert in the, in the newspaper, and. The average price was 117 pounds, as I, as I recall. Now, 117 pounds—that's every week, and well, that would have been painful paying that every week till you got to a deal. Mm -hmm. And that was only one kind of—we've got, about, you know, as I said, about 12 different methods of marketing on an area. But this particular one was 117 a week, and that, that's quite—that's uh, quite expensive. Mm -hmm. So, what we did was we did a couple of phone calls. We got, we found all the newspapers and made two phone calls to each newspaper, and we go through a particular script and a particular, you know, way around uh, doing it. In fact, if everyone's seen the uh, the American cop show Columbo, where he's <laughs> a little bit, a little bit dumb, a little bit thick in the uh, in the in the in the house, or he, or he acts a bit dumb. That's what we're like with the newspapers. We're just a bit thick, and the, and the thing is, the thicker we are, the better res results you get out of it because. We need to take the pitch, and we need to ask how the newspapers work, and how the uh, where to advertise, and where works best, and what's the best price, and the best deals I can do, and, and we just ask the questions. Yeah. And 
I was doing this in, uh, as I said, in Bournemouth, and I was asking all the different questions about these um, uh, these adverts and stuff. And finally, this one lady, it was about call number ten, I think it was, um, finally said, "Look, I can do you a big stamp every week of the year for four pound fifty a week. Just sign the deal." <laughs> I thought, "Wow, <laughs> wow." <laughs> that just happened in one call, you know, or one day normally. It normally takes a few weeks to do that. But if you just found a newspaper, it's kind of a hundred pounds, hundred fifty pounds to advertise in, in in most classified. And if you do it slowly, mm. you're in what I I call it an enthusiastic buy, but you don't actually pay any money yet. Mm. And as long as you go down the the road slowly, you'll pick up the deals. So don't be in, be enthusiastic by all means because it's your business. But you don't have to spend lots of money. You just find out stuff. And then you start tripping over deals, and, and this four pound fifty a week. Well, well, I mean, we jumped on it because it would be it would be yeah, it'd be foolish not to jump on four pound fifty a week for the, for the newspaper. So we did it. So the biggest challenge is go slower than you are doing, um, but do put the time in and do the work. Yeah, that, that's a great uh, bit of advice there as well. I like that the Colombo approach. <laughs> yeah, the club. I'm going to patent that. I think. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. All right. So, um, if someone was on a tight budget or didn't have that much time, um, what would you recommend uh, for them to help increase their investment or property investment knowledge? I would, um, I would do the books and the workshops definitely. So there's, I, I've got for, for any of you guys out there that are listening, and I'll send this over for a zoo, to a zoo. Is I've got a reading list of about 114 books. Um, I, I didn't put the list together. It's someone else uh, from Bristol that put the, the list together. Um, but 114 books is a fantastic place to start. You'd have to read them all, obviously. Um, but choose the ones that are there. And if you can do the audio um, on the books, if they're on, um, what do you call it? I can't remember now, audible.com um, or iTunes, uh, download the audio. And you can you can use it in the car. Because the thing is, uh, driving is, is downtime. I know, I know we, we kind of think we're going somewhere and it's traveling but it's actually downtime so that time in the car can be used for audio books um, on every single journey I'm, I'm driving up to York tomorrow it's, uh, it's about two and a bit hours from me in the car um, I'll be able to get a book on the way there and a book on the way back um, uh, done you know done and read and dusted so 114 books sounds a lot but it isn't um, it isn't a massive amount and then once you've read a book uh, or read a few books on the reading list is get on a workshop because a, a, a workshop it doesn't have to be my workshop but um, workshops that suit your strategy or suit the personality you, you know the, the advice that you want because workshops are fairly cheap they're, they're, they're a few hundred pounds rather than a few thousand and they're the, the kind of an interview for the for the trainer or for the coach because they'll give you or that should do give you as much information as they possibly can because the idea is that if the, you're out getting deals and you become partners and you know each other, you can do deals quicker and sharper and better and for more profit in the future. And that's why most people put workshops on is to is to do deals because the money's in the deals, not in the workshops, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so getting a couple of workshops and it doesn't it, the the strategies don't even have to match. You can do different workshops and different strategies, mm. but you're just meeting the people and meeting the you know meeting the trainers and and seeing who you get on with and who who sounds like. Um, it, it's someone you want to be like, or or the deals that you want to you want to do in your area. So so that's what I do: books and workshops, without a doubt. Yeah, that, I think that's a good bit of advice as well, because once you each one of those workshops or whatever is like um, is like a new tool into your toolbox. So when you then go out and meet these vendors or you're looking at deals, it you know you might not know that strategy inside and out, but as you've just pointed out. Um, you know the person running the workshop or you would have met someone on the workshop that might be more advanced than you that you might want to buddy up with and then you can work through it together but just knowing that this particular strategy exists can be very useful uh, and open up your mind to, to more possibilities when you're out there looking at um, various different types of deals so I think it's a good, good bit of advice there. Um, I wanted to ask if I, if you could do me, my listeners, uh, do us all a favour, and that was if anyone's got any other sort of questions that they they might like to ask of, of yourself at all, get in touch with you at all, um, is, is that possible to do it through these contact? <laughs> yeah, <it's on> <laughs> it's live. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, it's, so I was, uh, really, I want to know what's the best way to get hold of you. Uh, there's there's three ways to get hold of me really. There's telephone. If if I'm in the office, 
um, I'll an it's me that answers the phone. It's not a PA. Um, it's me that answers the phone. So if I'm in, I'll answer it. Um, if there's if there's not, then by all means leave a message, and I, and I always I call back anyway. If uh, that's my email, Mark at markiansen.com, um, and I'm always on my emails, whether I'm out or in the office, and then I'm, I'm quite often. In fact, I'm virtually always hooked up to Facebook as well. So if you spot me on a Facebook or friend me on Facebook, uh, it's I think there's only one Mark Ironson on there, but it, you'll recognise me anyway. Uh, come and chat to me on Facebook because I'm normally on there all the time. So, yeah, but by all means, keep in touch because I want you all to do deals. I want you guys out there making money and doing property deals because it's, uh, as I said earlier, we've got between one and three years of great, great, great marketplace and growth and, uh, and, and money out there, and that's what we're in it for is, is the money. So go out and happy hunting, I'd say. Great, and uh, you actually touched on, you said you have a number of uh, books and things like that, and some, uh, I, um, in part of my research, I, I found a wealth of information that you had already, I'd known about you from other events that I'd been on, and we've met a couple times before, but for those that haven't met you, don't uh, know you, but are interested in perhaps consuming um, some of the materials or resources that you mentioned before, um, that you've you've produced. Where might they be able to find those? Ah, well, <clears throat> there's there's a the, a book I wrote uh, last year, "Dominate Your Ground," and that's a "Dominate Your Ground" is an old military term when when we're in times of conflict and uh, uh, what the army do is they they move into an area either securing a hill or a, or an old shopping centre or a church or some form of building, and what they do is they do patrols outside that area, which get bigger every day. And that's exactly the same as business, because um, I transferred those skills back over to my business life when I came in, and that transfers equally over to property and running an area and running the patch, and hence why it's called Dominate Your Ground. So so that's the link. Uh, this book is for, uh, it's not for people who've already got a huge portfolio of property or anything, um, it's for those that are there's two types of people it's for. It's that for the ones at the beginning of the journey and they want to run an area, want to run the ground um, or their patch and stuff, it's for those. And it's also for those that um, are getting leads on the ground and they're not converting that well or they're not doing, they're not making as much profit as they think they should do. It's for those guys as well. Um, so it's, it's, it's I'm, I say it myself, I'm a bit biased. It's a fa fabulous <laughs> book. It's got 40 odd reviews of five stars on Amazon. Uh, it's, just type in the search bar of Amazon, dominate your ground, and it's on there. So. Um, that's the first uh, thing that that's an advert. That's an advert for my book. <laughs> and um, the second thing is come on a workshop. I won't pitch the whole workshops and stuff like that, but come on a workshop. I do three different types of workshop, and one's getting leads, one's doing deals, and the other one's trading deals. And I, I teach for quite a few different organisations out there. And by all means, message me on Facebook, and I'll tell you some more about them. Fantastic. Listen, Mark, thank you very much for your time today. It's been um, mind altering. <laughs> uh, seriously, you've given us some really good, uh, useful information that we can use and get out there and uh, start uh, making some kind of progress at least. Now, um, that's actually the end of uh, the video. So if you've actually liked it, please do. Uh, let us know in the comments below. We do value your feedback and interested to hear um, what you've got to say. If you want some more information um, uh, like this from other great, fantastic uh, coaches, experts, entrepreneurs that are involved in property investing, then please do go and check out our uh, website at successfulpropertyinvestmentsecrets.com where you'll get uh, a lot more great resources. Uh, my name's Azir Fatshaw and thank you very much for listening. I'll see you on the next video. Thanks. Thanks everyone.